This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Julie Cohen and Betsy West. How are you guys doing? We're great, Alex. <laughs> We've just been having a, having a lot of laughs before we started recording, so I do <laughs> appreciate you guys coming on. I did have the chance to watch your amazing new doc, Julia, uh, about Julia Childs, who I am a huge fan on, a fan of, and I've loved your past work as well, which we're going to get into. But let's just jump in. How did you guys get? How did you guys team up, and how did you get started in documentary? Well, big question. <laughs> big question. Uh, we teamed up through a project called the Makers Project, which was uh, possibly not so surprising given uh, some of the work that we've done subsequently about the history of the modern women's rights movement. Oh, very cool. Yeah, that was like 10 or so years ago. And then, you know, we went our separate ways, more or less. And then in 2015, uh, as Justice Ginsburg was kind of blowing up on the internet for the dissent she was writing, and we had, I had both interviewed uh, her prior to that, we came up with the idea of doing that documentary. And then subsequent to that, we've been working on a few films together. Now, what was it about a documentary for each of you that made you want to go into this side of storytelling, this side of the industry? <laughs> you know, the, when I look back on it, I always loved documentaries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I loved as a kid, I will now date myself watching the world at war and, um, you know, just longer uh, storytelling. But, you know, I became a, a uh, broadcast network news producer and a behind the scenes producer working on shorter format and then magazine pieces. Julie and I have sort of a similar background, but I always loved documentaries back in the day, even when they were kind of, it was kind of the D word, you know, documentaries weren't so hot <laughs> back then. Um, but I, that's really what I wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, s similar deal for me also came from the broadcast news world also just love documentaries like I like movies like movie movies. So doing uh, telling real stories in the format of movies is really fun. Like my favorite art is always true story art. I love photography. I even love music that's kind of documentary-ish, you know, the Bruce Springsteen's like Ghost of Tom Joad album that's really mm -hmm. sort of like a documentary in an album. Mm -hmm. Like anything that's anything that's real feels like kind of some of the, the coolest stories to tell. Now, how do you guys choose the subject matter that you guys tackle? Because it doesn't take, a, you know, six months three months to make one of these things. It generally takes a few years. And But how do you guys choose? And then how do you stay stay interested in it for so long? Well, I mean, you put your finger on it, Alex, really. You have to choose things that you want to spend two or three or four years on or else, you know, you'll, you'll go nuts. And I think, you know, with Justice Ginsburg, it was kind of one of those light bulb ideas of, oh, my goodness, what an amazing story, a current story, a backstory, a love story. I mean, you just couldn't have anything better than than working on that. You know, after that film, we started looking around for other projects and thinking about other women who perhaps had not been appreciated uh, so much and, you know, had had really been groundbreakers had really changed our world and that's when we landed on the idea of doing julia yeah i mean there's definitely not a formula that we have it's the main decision point is like do we want to delve into this because it is otherwise like you know making a documentary as your indie film audiences probably know like it's a it, it's just it's a lot of work it's a <laughs> lot of time a lot of the process is a big pain in the butt. So the reward side is feeling like you really love the subject matter. And we just realized like, oh, this one could really be fun. It's so different than um, other, other stories that we've uh, worked on in our careers. And like, there's just like so much joy uh, involved and kind of deliciousness. And it seems like subject matter that we really, really might kind of groove on. <laughs> You know, I think it also was a kind of uh, 
filmic challenge for us to do something different. Yes, Julia has archive, but also the opportunity to do some high-end food photography, which mm -hmm. neither of us had really done before, and to really dig into that, uh, we thought would be would be super fun. Now, uh, going back to RPG, what was what was it like working with her, interviewing her, being in the room with her? I, I mean, I have to ask because she's a, she's essentially an, an icon at this point. And she was an icon while she was she was a living icon when she was with us. What was that like? And how did you even approach that? When did, did you just call up? Listen, Ruth, <laughs> I would like to make this film about you. How did the whole process come to be? Uh, you know. Is step by step, basically, uh, we approached Justice Ginsburg pretty carefully and strategically. And initially, when we went to her with the idea of doing a documentary, she said, you know, not yet. I'm not ready. This was, you know, when she was in her early 80s, we're thinking, OK, but we she didn't say no to us. So then we came back a couple of months later with the idea of, oh, well, we're just going to start to interview people your friends and colleagues and whatever, you know, to kind of get her approval for that. And then we took it from there. So it was, we didn't go in saying, oh yeah, we want to do a documentary and can we go with you to the gym, by the way? Like we didn't start out <laughs> with that ask, even though in our minds we were thinking it would be fun to go with her to the gym, but it was um, a slow building of trust. It was a step-by-step. -step. So when you were approaching a, a subject, a subject like that, who is so high profile, you can't walk in with guns a blaring. You have to really kind of really baby step your way in to that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think you're always trying to uh, ask questions to which you can get the answer yes. So those need to be small questions first. You don't come at some, you have to think of it from their perspective. Like you don't come at someone with like a really, like, oh, we're gonna impose on you so much. We're gonna take up so much of your time. <laughs> we're gonna, you know, pick apart every aspect of your career. No, it's not like that. You're like, I mean, the, 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 the way to get the process going is to try to start to get it going. So trying to come up with things that you think that your subject might agree to. And in this case, as Betsy says, it, you know, the initial thing wasn't even about us interviewing or even filming the justices herself. It was about like, oh, is it okay with you if we start to interview some of the people who you've worked with in earlier phases of your career, just so, so that the project, so that she starts to get the, the sense that this project is moving forward and hear back from people that we interviewed like, oh, you know, these women were pretty serious about what they were doing and they seemed like they'd done some research and, you know, they seemed like they came in with this amazing, you know, woman cinematographer who had like greater, like th 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 this is like a real production happening here. So then you get that sense. And then the, at that stage, Justice Ginsburg let, it, let us start filming some of, you know, some public events that she was doing. And then later some more intimate or private events. And then the, the actual interview didn't happen until, you know, two, two, near the end of the process, actually, two years into, into filming. Now, I have to ask, I mean, how nervous were you to show it to her? <laughs> well, um, you know, amazingly, Justice Ginsburg never asked to see the film ahead of the screening at Sundance, mm -hmm. and um, which we thought was a real act of trust, or maybe she was just too busy, or who knows, <laughs> but she didn't ask. Uh, she agreed to go to the Sundance Film Festival. So we had both our major first premiere at Sundance there with Justice Ginsburg sitting across the aisle from us. And it was completely, totally nerve wracking. And, uh, you know, we were kind of watching her out of the side of our eyes the entire time as opposed to watching the film. And, <laughs> You know, she started laughing right at the beginning because there is sort of a kind of funny opening sequence mm -hmm. with statues saying mean things about her. And then, you know, just a little ways in, she pulled out a tissue and wiped her eye. And it was it was incredible. I, I can't even tell you what it was like to experience that and to have her like like the film and appreciate it. I mean, it just meant everything to us. And you guys were, did you guys premiere at the Eccles at Sundance? Or was it at the Egyptian? Uh, no, no. So, uh, give, give us the other, I'm trying to remember, but it was the Egyptian. The big one. The mark. Oh, okay. I was, was just, the mark. I was just trying to visualize it. 
you have about 500 people that have like a yeah. sort of bleachery, right? They're mm -hmm. sort of yeah. bleacher yeah. seats and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that must have been, and then, and then with the whole Oscar stuff going around, what was that like when you got that call? Well, you know, you don't get a call and you watch it on, you watch it on to what you watch <laughs> when you find out. with everyone else. Right. Um, the nominations being announced and uh, certainly uh, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we had our, we, our husbands made us breakfast. Right. So we were at my house and we had a really nice breakfast that we sat there and actually our name, the RBG name was the last one in the list of, of the nominees. So we actually thought when they named the fourth one and it wasn't us, we thought, okay, that's it. You know, we didn't. So that, that accounted for our rather exuberant reaction. <laughs> and it was more a reaction like, you're kidding. Yeah, we were very, we were real, we were quite surprised. So that yeah. was fun. So as the nominations were being announced, you're like, oh, just patch the hash browns. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're just like, it's over already. Well, we, we, had, we weren't that casual. We had eaten already. <laughs> okay, we good. <laughs> But, I got yeah, you. That's because, because we were the last one to be announced. Yeah. Like, as the other, you know, as the other films are being named, you sort of start to get the feeling that you're not gonna mm -hmm. be among them. So now, it was exciting. What was the biggest lesson you learned from working on RPG? Hi, the biggest lesson of from our working on RPG. I mean, I guess um, persistence. Yeah. You know slow and steady wins the game. I mean, that's what RBG did in her her life. Lots of setbacks, lots of discouragement, you know, for a super smart person who gets out of law school and can't get the kind of job that she really deserved. And then, you know, just started finding this opportunity to challenge not only the discrimination that she faced, but the discrimination that all American women faced and a world that people took for granted where women were second class citizens. I mean, right. kind of an extraordinary thing that really came out of the obstacles um, in front of her. So I guess it's a lesson of persistence and don't let anger get the best of you. Think, think strategically, okay? You're up against a wall. How am I going to get past that? Uh, that that was her approach. Now, when you guys are laying out a film, uh, how do you lay out the story? Do you discover the story along the way? Is there an outline? What is the actual documentary process as far as your, you guys are concerned? Yeah, the process is sort of like continually organizing and outlining the story and changing that as you go along. Like certainly at various stages, we have a rough idea of th thoughts of what you want the structure of the film to be. Then at a certain point in the process, um, our editor gets in the, involved. And in the case of both RBG and Julia, our, the same brilliant editor, Carla Gutierrez, um, was part of that process with us. So, you sort, you know, we sort of, you have very, you know, you have very tentative outlines in mind, but often what works the best, I mean, we, we like to, um, start, you know, in the same way that I was saying, you're trying to get to a yes, pretty, or, 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 we, you know, we try to start with some scenes that we really think are going to work, not worry about like the whole thing in one, in, in one sitting, but just like, you know, take a bite of it, take a small slice of what the story might be. And like, once there's a really beautiful scene, then that gives you the optimism that you need to push to the next level and sort of piece things together. And if they're working, keep going in the direction that things are working. And if they're not working, make revisions to the parts that aren't working. Yeah, I mean, we do use, uh, you know, the sort of modern method of the little post-its on a <laughs> wall, which filmmakers know where you have, you write the scenes and the the things that you expect you're going to have to cover and you put them on a wall only we do it on digitally now with this thing called Jamboard, which uh, you can use to just move scenes around. And as Julie said, we start cutting scenes. I mean, in the case of Julia, one idea we had was, okay, people have seen this archive of Julia, you know, the, the, her cooking lessons have been repeated thousands of times and, you know, people love watching them, but 
how fun to deconstruct the making of that show of the French chef from the very beginning. And we had the opportunity to do that because the producer, Russ Marash, is still around. And we found the stage manager, Alex Pyrie, and, you know, sat them down and had them take us through what it was like to put together this <laughs> show, this groundbreaking show in 1963. And it was so fun, you know, to get the the scenes of the kind of makeshift studio that they had and the photographs that Julia's husband took behind the scenes. I mean, I think people going to a documentary, they want to experience a world. You know, they want to be immersed in a world that they didn't necessarily know. They may know the characterization of Julia. They may cook some of Julia's food. But do they really understand Julia's world and what it took to become Julia Child? And, and that's what we were, were trying to get at. Yeah, what I, was, what I found so wonderful about the film was that, you know, my experience with Julia was obviously I knew her growing up. My mom had the, the book and, and everything. I probably saw her on TV once or twice. Um, but it was Julia and Ju it was a Julie Julia, Julie, that, that, yeah. that, the Meryl Streep. Julia, uh, Julia yeah. yeah, which was a fantastic film. But that was the introduction to her story. And it kind of skims over a lot of stuff because it's, you know, it's a, it's a movie. But what you guys did was you went so deep into it, and I really didn't realize how groundbreaking she truly was. I mean, she she changed how America cooked. It was, uh, and also it was uh, you know a women's rights um, icon as well. But before we uh, keep going, what did how did Julia come? Uh, how did you decide on Julia and and said okay, we're going to spend three or four years with Julia? And how long did it take? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you could say it took, it, it was three years from the time that we sort of first considered maybe doing it and the time the film came out, but like the first year of that is just trying to make the whole thing happen and trying to get someone who's going to fund it and trying to get <laughs> the various entities, mainly the Julia Child Foundation, um, as well as WGBH, the, the uh, Boston PBS station that had, you know, rights to so much of that archive, like getting everyone on board kind of took a year and then two years basically to make um, the film. And like the decision was, and it's for the reasons that you said, because, because Julia was groundbreaking and groundbreaking in ways that were going to let us in our film show the context of like, what was the crappy food that Americans were eating in the pre-Julia era? What was the vision of women on television that was being that were you know being elevated before Julia came on the scene? Like in order to understand how big a leap she made, you had to know what the world was before, and that gave us the opportunity in our film to like set those contexts. And we knew because we know those worlds, <laughs> like we know about <laughs> bad food and we know about sexism, so we understood that we would be able to that it would actually be pretty entertaining to lay that stuff out in a film form. Yeah, and and what I loved also is that you you really focused on the love story, like her, her love story with um with her husband is, it's just beautiful, and what he did was groundbreaking as well. A man of his generation, to just push her in the into the spotlight, and he was happy in the background. Um, is so it was like you said it in the documentaries, like that just doesn't that, that didn't happen at that with those guys. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we are attracted to story, to, to subjects who have a good love story. And certainly the Paul and Julia story is fantastic because it starts out with Paul being the one who is opening up Julia to the world. You know, she had lived a rather privileged and sheltered life until she volunteered for World War II and met Paul in, in, the, uh, in Salon where they were both posted. And, um, you know, he was a worldly guy, 10 years older, knew about art, culture, knew about food, you know. So when they married and moved to France for, for his job uh, with the State Department, uh, that's when Julia just blossomed and discovered her passion for food and started cooking for Paul, which was really good for him. And we have, you know, a scene in the film uh, kind of illustrating uh, some <laughs> of the benefits uh, that, that Paul, Paul and Julia's love affair um, in, in France. And then, as you said, something unusual happened. Paul's career was in decline. He had left the State Department. He really didn't have anything to do. They'd moved back to the United States. And Julia 
suddenly her cookbook after 12 years mm. is published and she goes on television and and becomes a kind of superstar and paul's reaction to that was just to help her every step of the way to believe in her believe in her when she was writing the book that nobody else thought was a good idea and to believe in her when she became a a, a superstar and to continue to help her for the next three decades uh, it's kind of extraordinary it's extremely extraordinary and the, the other thing i found that uh, watching the documentary is that she was absolutely fearless like she threw herself into whatever and she didn't care what anyone else said how old was she when she started in this stage of her life wasn't she in her in her early 50s she, yeah, she was 50 years old when she first showed up on television like julia was not famous until she was 50 which truthfully is another part of the story that we really uh loved and um you know just like a good reminder for audiences and particularly kind of young women in the audience to see like no you actually don't have to have have it all together and be ready to break out when you're 22 there are all kinds of different paths that people can take and you know so that that was seemed pretty you mean, cool you mean you didn't have it all figured out at 22 i mean i obviously <laughs> i mean jeez yeah i mean i think that, i think there's something about uh, the fact that Julia did have this later in life success that gave her the sort of confidence that she had, right. you know, and uh, once <laughs> once she got there, she really she really was pretty strong in her beliefs about how to carry on in her life uh, in just in all aspects. And yet also someone who evolved and who changed. And, and we love that part of the story as well. It's not just like, oh, Julia went on television in the early 60s, it became famous and that was it. I mean, there were, there were many more chapters and some challenges when uh, she was kind of being pushed off the air uh, by PBS and how she met that challenge and, um, and how she evolved in her thinking on social issues like homosexuality, which right. was, you know, pretty major in the 1980s. And, and she really uh, changed her her thinking and her prejudice, frankly, about homosexuals. Uh, so those parts, those aspects of the story of Julia's ongoing evolution, uh, you know, really appealed to us. The per the persistence that that Julia had is is absolutely remarkable. To be on a book for twelve years, I mean, many filmmakers listening and writers listening can really feel that because when I started, it's like, yeah, we were on the book for twelve. Years. To sit and to do anything for 12 years and to keep going and to keep going no matter what, um, when there was no hope, there was really no, there was no, there was no signpost anywhere that said this was a good idea. It's not like you're right. making a movie and they're like, well, other movies have been made before and made money or were successful. There was nothing like it. And she's just kept trying until finally someone opened the door for her. It was just, it was just so inspiring to see that. Yeah, I mean, I think that Julia and the French colleagues that she was working with to develop that book really felt strongly that what they were doing was a good idea and would be valuable for home cooks. And that was that was the deep impetus. As you say, there was there was nobody saying this is a fantastic idea. They had gotten an extremely small advance money that would have long run out. But in the first year, let alone the 12th year, it wasn't like there was you know, nobody was chomping at the bit waiting for this book. They would just like had this vision like, oh, this would be amazing. And I think they felt like they would get some real fulfillment out of putting on, you know, putting down on paper, like some of the amazing French techniques of, of cooking that, um, you know, that are well known in France and, and, and very much not known uh, in the US. Like they thought it would be a worthwhile thing to do. And that's where it started. Not so much. I mean, like, yes, of course they wanted commercial success. As the 12 years go on, that is seeming less and less likely. <laughs> and, yet, like, and I think that's a that's a lesson that everyone listening needs to take on. It's like if you believe in yourself, it's something that's just so believe and the world hasn't caught up to that idea. Yet. It took the world 12 years to catch up to yeah. that idea, essentially. Yeah. And then it took another it took a little bit longer for them to catch up with her being a 50 year old TV star on PB. I mean, it's just insane. <laughs> it's like a PBS in Boston somewhere is like she makes an omelet and then all of a sudden like hey you want a show okay we don't know how to do a show let's just do this and it just it's, it's like if you would write it in a in a screenplay you'd be like that doesn't make any sense 
you know, the thing, the part of that that I just love is that, you know, Julia just connected with the audience uh, immediately. It wasn't like the executives said, oh, we've got a potential star here. Let's invest <laughs> in this Julia Child person. Let's bring her along, you know? No. <laughs> they said, okay, we'll do three shows. We'll, you know, we'll pay you a minimal amount of money. And, um, you know, she was instantly just memorable. You know, people were like, who is that woman? <laughs> what <laughs> that crazy voice? But she's funny and but and she knows a lot. And we love watching her. So it, to me, it's this example of going direct to the audience. And and, um, you know, that that's how it happened. It was not the TV execs who were doing it. And what I loved also that you, you mentioned in the documentary was the SNL skit by Dan Aykroyd which I always wondered, I'm like, I wonder if she actually got a kick out of that or not. And it's, and the answer is in the documentary, you were like, oh, okay. <laughs> that she brought it out constantly and constantly bringing it out to show people. Um, that, that must have been, I mean, she was an icon. She was even in, in the 75, was that 75? Yeah, that was from 75. And remember, I mean, remember what, you know, what SNL in the 70s was, what a huge big deal it was. <laughs> Just like, you know, one of our characters mentions that like, in the early days of Julia show in the mid sixties, everyone would be like, did you see Julia child, you know, this week, have you seen Julia's episode? Yeah. And of course that's what SNL was by the mid seventies. Like every Sunday, I mean, I was a kid at that point and every Sunday it was just like breaking down what happened on <laughs> SNL the night before. And I think that Julia understood that having Dan Aykroyd impersonate her was a real sign of, you know, cultural stardom. zeitgeist. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, so she appreciated that, but like, you know, the, the problem, I mean, at the time, I think it's so fantastic. The problem is the decades have gone on that Betsy and I kind of came to discover that people who are familiar with Julia vaguely, like that's what they remember that, you know, a caricature <laughs> of right. a completely zany, completely, off the rails like drunk lady you know <laughs> with a chicken and like you right. know Julia, Julia Child actually was a lot more than that not only was she a yeah. real crab but was like a true expert in in food and bringing that expertise to Americans like in a way that mattered so we are amused by that as Julia was but we also wanted to you know the whole point of the film is kind of to tell you what the real story is behind that caricature yeah, absolutely. And you did a fantastic job doing that. Um, now, did you learn what li what life lessons did you learn from Julia? I mean, because I mean, you when you go into when you go into a subject matter like this, like with RPG, that you you have to something has to rub off on you. So, what was I'll that thing? I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. You know, I like to cook, but often weeks go by before I really do cook, and sometimes my ambition gets the better of me. Like I think <laughs> I can create some great thing, and it's like. It's 10 of seven and the guests are coming soon and I'm like doing four different dishes and often I'll be disappointed with how one or the other came out. And I, in the past, would apologize. Oh, you know, like this corn thing, it was supposed to rise more or whatever. I am never, ever apologizing again for a dish that I serve to people. I mean, and I love that attitude. Julia's whole point was, oh, you make a mistake, you make the best of it, you turn the the potato souffle into something else and you just serve it. You know, you so you turn the dessert that flopped into a soup and you serve <laughs> it and you do not apologize. So that's my life lesson. And I once the pandemic and the shutdown is over and I actually am entertaining regularly again, um, I plan to uh, implement that advice. And again, a before her time feminist message because like apologizing for one right. is a big lady problem. Like it just, yeah. you know, you do have an inclination when you're presenting what you've done to a room full of people to start pre-telling them like everything that's wrong with <laughs> what you did. Like, oh, this was actually supposed to be bad. I, you know, I used baking flour when I was supposed to use cooking flour. It fell on the floor. It was like, did you serve the food? Like, and Julia was like, you know, we all make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. But that said, don't like apologize for them. Just like, you know, say that's what you know. Say you meant this to be that kind of dish. It's fine. Like everyone, like if you, if you, did a, if you give it a little hype, like 
<laughs> the boys often do. That's going to that's going to change people's perception of it and of you. And it's a great it's a great Julia lesson. Yeah, as you know, I mean, I was I, I was raised surrounded by women. So I have I have no brothers or sisters, but I was just women, very strong women around me at all times. And now with my family, my daughters and my wife, I have no testosterone at all in my life. Uh, <laughs> just the cat and the cat uh, got fixed. So uh, <laughs> so I, I, I feel that. And as as a, a young man, you never, ever taught to apologize for anything. You just go with it. You roll with it. And and as I'm teaching my my girls that I'm like, no, no, you, I'm teaching them to be strong women and to teach them from a male side point of view and also from a female side point of view uh, with my wife of like, no, th this is the world and this is what you're going to be walking into. And my God, I can't even imagine walking into the world that she walked into or she lived in. Um, you yeah. know, it's such a yeah. different world. Yeah, and then imagine the world in France. I mean, we love that oh. part of the film in <laughs> France to kind of create how what kitchens were like there. Yeah. I mean, talk about a macho, sexist environment oh. that Julia Child walked into, you know, going to the Cordon Bleu with the master chef and the students were all male GIs from the U.S. who were using the GI Bill to further their education before they went back to cook in restaurants in the United States. And Julia is the only woman. We love that. And she seemed to have a kind of confidence about her, which I think was, you know, just part of her makeup, you know, that she she didn't mind being six foot two. Right. Some women really don't like being so tall. It didn't but didn't seem to bother her. She married a man who was shorter than she was. I mean, it, it she didn't have that um, self-consciousness. And I think also in breaking into a male world that she found herself in France, she was just very matter of fact about it. I want to learn how to cook. This is the best place to do it. And please, you know, let me into this class and, of course, impress them all. It, and again, that fearlessness in, in what she said, because she towered over most men. Yeah. I mean, right, yeah. easily. I think that's also probably a little bit of where the confidence came from because she'd always towered over over men. So in many ways, I mean, man, this is just me, my my psychoanalysis of it. But you know, she does feel that that kind of vibe, and you see these pictures of her in the in the documentary where she's these guys are just so small. <laughs> she's just towering over, and it's just the confidence to do whatever she wants. Yeah. It's yeah, it's pretty and the interesting thing is, even though all of the ways that, you know, we're kind of socialized as women sometimes to be a little apologetic or a little demure or not show yourself, you know, off into the world. And Julia's self, the self-confidence and the feeling and the and and, and the being her selfness is exactly what the audiences responded to. They completely got that this was an authentic person they saw that they're seeing the real julia they liked that she was fearless they liked that she wasn't apologizing they liked that she was loud even like everything that was real about julia which is a lot of things that girls actually aren't taught to be even still is actually what the public really responded to in and not just women like guys liked her too yeah and, th and that's the thing i love the word you use authentic because that's exactly what she was rbg was is that they they were who they were and they were comfortable in their own skin and weren't trying to impress they weren't trying to be something they were not they weren't putting an instagram filter on themselves in, in many ways and that's what people are drawn to i mean in all of your work even doing news and other things throughout your career uh, have you noticed the same thing i have is that the people who get the attention of some, t not all the times, but they are who they are and they're not trying to be something they're not, generally speaking, especially the important people, meaning important people, meaning that people who are changing the world, people who are being of service to the world, like RBG, like Julia, because they, I mean, you can't fake Julia. <laughs> like that was, that's a hell of a performance if she's pulled that off for so many years. That's who she was. Do you find that that's one of those common factors in all the work that you've done over the years? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure that I would want to make that generalization across the board. No, it's case um, by case, right? I think it's somewhat case by case. I mean, look, people are very different. <laughs> There's such a huge variety of people. And sometimes, you know, you'll 
what was so and so like? Oh, they're exactly like what they are, you know, what you would imagine on television. And, you know, you know, you can say that, but that's not always the case. Right. There are certainly people who have a pretty <laughs> good public. And, and I think that's, you know, sometimes there, there are intro, sort of introverted people who then get in front of a camera and they kind of transform into something else. And I'm not saying I'm going to call that phony. I'm just saying yeah. that's the way they are. And then they get off camera and, okay, that's it. You know, they're moving on to something else. I mean, that was not the case with Julia. I mean, Julia right. was an extremely outgoing people person, loved being on television and loved meeting people in the grocery store. It didn't really matter to her. So I would say it's true of her. And it's, and it's uh, you know, I think... Justice Ginsburg, a very different character of, you know, really was an introvert who later in life had this amazing uh, uh, celebrity, but she was pretty true to her personality, I think, throughout um, and, and was very much the same, you know, off and on camera, I think, in a way. But I wouldn't want to generalize it to everybody. Do you agree, Julie? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was when it was when uh, Alex brought in our... Um broadcast news uh, careers that we were both like, mm. yeah. <laughs> some people that were, I mean, you know, look, there are people that have gotten uh, called out in recent um, mm -hmm. years yeah. not being the same nice guy on television that they, sure. in, in, in real life, that they might have appeared to be on your morning television yeah. show. So, yeah. I'm just saying. There is, there is that. Yes, there, there was is a, that. Yes, Julie had a nice smile on her face as you were talking. Betsy, she's like, mm, okay, I got, yep, it's in my head. I know who it is. <laughs> now, um, I, I have to ask you, what do you think Julia would do with today's technology of social media, of all of that stuff? Do you think she would have, would she have an Instagram account even in the later years of her life? Would she be out there really kind of connecting with her audience in that way? In your opinion? Well, there's an interesting mixed thing. Like, of, uh, my husband actually always likes to talk about. There's there's some uh, there's some hypothetical about like what if Napoleon had had a B fifty two and like. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, so yeah. Sort of, this is sort of similar. What if Julia had had? Uh, I think which I think even might be an SNL skit. But what if Julia had had Instagram? There's sort of there's sort of a two part answer. One is that the whole love of food on Instagram is really the world that Julia created, that like food is this amazing thing that so much it's not just what we get to nourish ourselves, but you know, it's like to be celebrated and shown off. And like, so that's like really a uh, validation of who Julia was. On the other hand, Julia had a rule. We mentioned it in the film. She called it French rules, which is when your food is served and still hot, you eat it immediately. You do not stop what you're doing to take the most glamorous overhead picture <laughs> of it. Food is meant to be eaten, not photographed. So, <laughs> she on both sides of that. Now, did you guys find yourself um, uh, eating more uh, while you made this thing? Because I found myself wanting to eat more as those beautiful uh, food uh, footage that you guys were shooting that I knew were an archival. Because I was looking, I'm like, oh, that's fresh. <laughs> did you find yourself like? I mean, did you find a new respect for food? Did you find a new, uh, just you know, all of that while making this? Yeah, I mean, we have to say that we filmed most of it before the shutdown. We filmed a lot of it in mm -hmm. 2019, including an amazing trip to France that was really so much fun <laughs> to be to visit Julia's haunts and to eat some great food. Um, but, you know, I think when the shutdown happened, all of us changed our relationship to food and to cooking. And, you know, I found myself going to the farmer's market, you know, mm -hmm. shopping outside and thinking more about fresh food. And definitely, um, you know, both my husband and I were just cooking for each other every single night. And one night we made like a list of all of our regular dishes that we liked, you know, that were in our rotation. And there were like about I don't know, 45 of them that were in our oh. now in our rotation. And I think so we really expanded our possibilities. And I guess that was partly about the pandemic. And I think partly because all day long, you know, <laughs> I was being immersed in in this world of food in the middle of the pandemic. We managed to do the high end cinematography that 
that you see throughout the film, uh, that which was last summer, uh, that we filmed under somewhat difficult circumstances with everybody masked or whatever, and created a, a studio uh, uh, down in uh, in Chelsea and uh, replicated Julia's kitchen. Our producer Holly Siegel did an incredible job, basically. Uh, having a shop construct Julia's kitchen and sourced all the copper pots and the garland stove and everything else, and then filmed for about a week uh, with our cinematographer, uh, Claudia Rashke. And then similarly in France, we were filming with a uh, photographer using macro technology, mm -hmm. uh, really tight shooting and slow-mo of the food. That was uh, Nanda Bradelard in Paris, we intended for the two of them to be together or to, but because of the pandemic, that was not possible. So we did the Paris shoot remotely. So that there was, was a lot of thinking about food and I guess it did influence <laughs> us. Yeah, and our, our we, we, we brought in a food stylist and, and cook, Susan Spungen, who not only prepared all the film and actually you well, prepared all the food and you actually see her in the film sometimes because it's kind of her hands that are rolling out the dough and that sort of thing, but helped us in the substantive quest of figuring out which Julia Child recipes would work well with which scenes. Like one example is we wanted to show something kind of messing up uh, during the phase that they're experimenting with all different recipes. And we talked to Susan about like, oh, what could we show that would like, screw up all the time. She came up with hollandaise sauce and how it breaks and looks all curdly and disgusting. And then, you know, if we're looking for the sort of love in the afternoon sensual scene, oh. we asked her and we had a number of discussions, you know, what is the, so what dessert is like the sexiest? Like, what do you think? And we went in thinking it was going to be chocolate because when you think desserts, like chocolate is the first in your mind. But then she described to us that pear tart and every oh. step involved of the, the rolling the dough and the poaching the pears in red wine and oh. the, or that custard thing. Beautiful. Like now I'm gonna have to go and eat. But um, so when you talk about like were we in, I mean, you know, just the enthusiasm for even certain certain food groups uh, definitely grew during the production of this film. Yeah, that tart. Uh, when I was watching it, is it's a fairly sensual uh, tart. <laughs> I it's I had no idea tart could be sensual. I was watching. I was like, "Wow, I want to, I want to, I want to have a slice of that right now." <laughs> now, um, where can people watch the film? And when is it be released? People, yes, people can see Julia in theaters in New York and Los Angeles starting November twelfth, and then it will be rolled out in many many theaters in. Uh, cities around the country in the subsequent weeks. Uh, so by Thanksgiving, uh, it should be <laughs> available. <laughs> if you want to see it before your Thanksgiving meal, you might want to have a snack just yes. beforehand so you're not yes. too hungry uh, <laughs> during it or whatever. I think it's a good, it's, it's potential good uh, Thanksgiving fare. Now, and what advice would you give a filmmaker who wants to get into the documentary uh, game? Whoa. <laughs> it's, a hard, it's a hard question. I mean, I think, you know, there's, on the one hand, technology is such that people could be experimenting with making short films um, on their own, that probably doesn't mean that that's something that's going to be headed for distribution. The other thing is to just, you know, get there. There are a lot of uh, documentary production companies all around and getting in on the ground floor um, in the interning and production assistant uh, mode is kind of always the way to, to start. But like learning, learning some technical skills is kind of important. Some shooting and editing skills is, is great these days, as well as sort of some substantive knowledge. We always try to tell people it's actually good to know, like when people ask like, oh, should I major in film or communications in my undergraduate college? Like maybe, but also it's actually good to learn some things about the world and to understand something about business or science or politics or history. Like, you know, for spe especially for documentaries, like, you need to have some grounding in the real world before you're maybe going out and trying to say something about the world, which in, at its heart is what making a documentary 
is all about. Um, now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions to ask all of my guests. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> I'll start. Yeah. Since, since, since you I do have one. Let me go. I think of one while, while you. Uh, I have yeah, one. Oh, you got one? Yeah, I have one. But you go ahead. You go. First. Okay. I was just gonna say to not worry too. I mean, in some ways, it fits in the, with the messages we were saying earlier. To not worry too much about things that go wrong. Like when something goes a little wrong, that's all right. Things have gone wrong in every film that we've made and you all it, it it comes around like the biggest problem is what happens after the thing goes wrong where everyone is so panicked about the thing that went wrong and trying to convince themselves and the others that it is not their fault that then a, a cascade of things begin to go wrong from there so like things go wrong forgive yourself and move on yeah i mean i took to heart uh rbg's uh advice which she got from her mother, basically that um, don't waste your time on anger, you know, right. try to move past it. And yes, it doesn't mean you're not going to be angry. Of course, you're going to get angry. You're a human being. But try not to get consumed by anger and just find the the way around it because it's it's a waste of your energy. Now, in any of your projects, there must have been a day that the whole world came crashing down around you. What was that event and how did you get past it? And what did you use to get past it? Well, I would say my whole world came crashing down around me when I lost a job in a very high profile way in uh, 2005 when I was at CBS News. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was kind of uh, a wake up for me and but opened up doors to a whole new life because mm -hmm. I had been an executive and, you know, executive jobs are risky. <laughs> you know, you're always, <laughs> you're always the person, you know, that, that, that gets blamed when something goes wrong underneath you. And, you know, that's sort of what happened to me. But in general, I think executive jobs are tough. And I realized that I so loved making stories telling stories right. that's what i really love more than i loved being an executive although you know i think i was okay at it but i really loved doing that and so that allowed me to pivot back to what i love doing the most and Ju julie yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Crash. I don't laughs> never crash. she's never crashed well, the crashing the crashing experience to, to me the thing that i associate most with that is like when you know something that you thought was gonna happen like doesn't happen and that actually happens a lot in a world like where you thought you had a shoot and then you didn't and the person cancels or you thought you had a booking and someone was going to cooperate with something and they didn't and sort of similar to what betsy was saying like in the end you Oh, I almost think almost everything that happens, there's a way in the end think like, oh, it was good that that did it. It was great that yeah. we didn't actually get that person because it would have best, it wouldn't have led mm -hmm. to the next thing that was so amazing. So, right. yeah. and last, you gotta have perspective. And last question, uh, three documentaries that all documentarians should watch. Oh my God. All right, all right. Hoop Dreams. Yes. To my mind. And I saw the remastering of Hoop Dreams thinking, oh my God, this thing is so long. You know, I think it's like three hours or something. And I was thinking maybe it's too long. It is, it's just masterful. It's, it's unbelievable. It I love that film and, mm -hmm. and was so lucky to see it again recently. Um, all right, that's one. Documentary <laughs> you can see. I think I'm going to say Waltz with Bashir. Um, mm -hmm. I really recommend that to everyone. It's an animated doc that came out probably around 2008, something like that, that it's like, just telling a story in a really new way, but that feels really emotionally profound. So that's one that I think of. And one more. Any, any, of, you, any, any of you. I won't put you on the, on, on the spot for three each. <laughs> okay. There's so many. Um, like for me, it was like searching for Sugar Man. Uh, yeah. which was, was great. 
That was a great one. And then walking the was it walking the line or the one with the, the about the type rope guy between the t- the, the twin towers? Oh, yeah. mean hard wire. Hard yeah. wire. We both, we both loved um Raul Peck's uh, "I Am Not Your Negro." I am not your Negro. Oh, it was really amazing. Really different take on an archival. Fi- it's like yeah. an essay. It's an archival film. It tells yeah. you something about American history. Um, okay. You know, I really like stories. Stories We Tell, you know, that Sarah Polly yeah, film, Sarah Polly. Mm-hmm. which I thought was just really pushing the boundaries of storytelling in a way that works. Like sometimes I think the boundaries get pushed in a way that <laughs> confused me. <laughs> but I thought that was, wow, what an interesting way to tell a first person film. I don't know. I like that a lot. Betsy and Julie. <laughs> But thank you guys again so much for being on the show. I truly appreciate it. And I I hope everybody goes out and sees Julia. And and if you haven't seen RBG, you have to go see RBG as well. So thank you guys for doing what you're doing. And please continue making amazing documentaries. So thank you. We will. (laughs) 